I have to say, this is going to be my uh, last, this is going to be my little swan song with you uh, this morning. Actually, probably, unfortunately, we're not even going to be on hand this evening for the uh, real reason for this whole get together, which is uh, <laughs> the evening concert. <laughs> So I'm I'm very I'm very disappointed that we'll be missing that. But it has been a very it's been a wonderful occasion for me, and I think I can speak uh, for my wife and daughter. May I? I don't know where my daughter is. May I? She's doing this. So that's <laughs> but yeah, it's been wonderful. I uh, last time I was in England was when I was 13 years old. Uh, and needless to say, that was a very long time ago. Uh, the Beatles were still going strong back then, <laughs> so I don't need to tell you about that. But it's really wonderful. That, at that time, of course, I had no thought about, no connection to anything related to theosophy or the Theosophical Society. So this particular coming back has been something that uh, has really been of a very different character for me. Um, and two, I find myself here in a position that is totally different, and it's, uh, it's new for me as well. I think you all know it's been about a year and maybe a little over a year and a half since I've been in this position as international president for the Theosophical Society. So that's something that has uh, a lot of effects, outwardly, certainly. I mean, I know a whole lot more about airplanes and airports than I ever wanted to know. So that's the outward side of it. But inwardly, it's one of those things that also makes certain demands. Um, this Theosophical Society, I don't think I need to tell you, it's not something that came into being haphazardly or by accident. It's not something that was the development of a couple of very, very smart or very, very clever people. So it's, it's not even something that really in its essence is really even humanly inspired. It's inspired from a human perspective, but from the sort of humanity that we can be, but somehow don't realize that we are. So that's... It places certain demands. We have a rich history which in the, within the Theosophical Society. Traditions abound. And as with all things, it seems as if at the beginning of our society, when this impulse was new or renewed in the world, it was something that was really carried forward by a certain fervor and a certain direct connection to the source of these teachings and of this wisdom. Um, it was no, nobody made any mistakes about it, that this is something that was really the result of an inspiration from the masters of the wisdom. And so that was what moved us into this world and that moved us, gave the impetus at the beginning. And then it was handed over to us, to those future generations, to try to do our best to grasp what had been given and then to apply it. I don't know about you, but my experience has been this. I mean, just in normal living, that very often you have people in this world who receive an inheritance. There are people whose parents or grandparents, some previous generation, worked, had certain insights, did the hard work, sacrificed, bled, in order to be able to pass something on to this next generation. And it's always very interesting to see how it's picked up and what's done with it. I mean, very often there are, in England, of course, there are family fortunes that have been through generations. There are also very wealthy families for whom everything was lost. 
because the meaning of it was not appreciated fully by those who came next. So it's up to us, really, to decide which category we fall into. We have a wealth of teachings. Uh, I think, really, in many respects, the early work of the Theosophical Society has been done, and has really been done, stupendously. Which is to say, a certain conceptual basis for the next step in human development did not exist in 1875. You know, the terms that we find can speak of so freely, the language that we can use to describe these inner states wasn't even in existence at that time. And now you open a dictionary and karma's in there. You go into the grocery store and the person ahead of you in line is talking about reincarnation or some inner experience. It's been firmly planted now in human culture, these many of these things. Certainly the you know, elements of it are there, and are there because, very specific, specifically because of the work that has been done by the Theosophical Society and its founders and the members that have come thereafter. So it's a really, it's a remarkable thing to think that the world culture has been impregnated with certain ideas in a period of a hundred some years. So that part of it, there's still more to do, obviously. I mean, the full context of what we know as theosophy is not something that is popular, uh, you know, grist for the popular mill. That we know. But the basis to take this next step, to have the conversation that leads to some deepening of the understanding is spread throughout the world now. And, you know, we can pat ourselves on the back because the Theosophical Society's imprint is all over that. So that's great. Uh, but, you know, in the words of some people, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> the past is a wonderful thing. So we find ourselves now in a certain position. The Theosophical Society is in 70 countries in the world. Um, we have actual organized national sections in 25 countries of the world, so there's a broad spreading. Uh, one of the things we find is that around the world we have resources of various types. We have books, we have buildings, we have bank accounts, we have you know all of the trappings of uh, something that is solid and rooted in this world. We are institutionalized. And with institutions, oftentimes comes a certain degree of necessary crystallization. It's got to happen. And so we find ourselves in that, in that position as well, to some degree. All of these things that I've talked about are necessary, and we have to have a building to meet in. You have to. Anybody, I, I've known this, and I run into people who have this mind everywhere in the world, that there is the spiritual, and then there is the world. And that really, if you start talking about, you know, don't tell me about money. Let's talk about the divine. <laughs> because this is real, and only this. And a lot of those people tend to be shivering in the winter and hungry <laughs> because it, we're, we are dual in many ways. And anyone who is not cognizant of the needs, just as an individual, but also the needs of an organization, to a certain degree, I view that as somewhat irresponsible. You know, I got to this position of being the international president. How? I can guarantee you it wasn't because I wanted this <laughs> and asked for it. 
In fact, when I was asked to do this, I refused. I refused. I knew a little bit too much about this position to want anything like this. <laughs> but the problem for me has been this, that from, probably like many of you, that theosophy and the need that I perceive for this possibility of ex this way of experiencing the world is so necessary and is so vital that to not do what you can to further it in this world I, just for me it was something that has gotten me into trouble time and time again because I find myself saying this very dangerous word it's as many letters as the shortest book in the Bible. You all know from last night. Y-E-S. Yes. It's a dangerous word. So will you? Yes. Can you? Yes. Will this help? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I have a counselor who's come to help me with to learn this word. No. <laughs> and she's a necessary counselor, <laughs> let me tell you. But so, you know, I find myself here in large measure because I have said yes. I mean, it's involved things and it's involved activities, but mainly what I have said yes to is the possibility of a way of living together as a humanity and of growing into the greater potentials that are here for all of us. That's what I feel myself open toward. And so things that can be done in that direction are what I want to do. And you always try and choose the most efficient, the most effective way that these things can be accomplished, because who wants to waste time? We don't have a lot of it, any of us. But I'm not going back to that depressing death stuff. <laughs> but so you choose the method, the pathway that will be, in fact, most effective. And for me, it's very clear that you can work on the symptomatic level. You know, you can help symptoms. And we need to do that. You don't want somebody to be laying there bleeding or, you know, suffering from some disease that's come. You want to help to soothe that. But really, we need to talk in terms of causes, talk in terms of actual healing. And the thing that is most healing, knowledge, has its role, but its main role, knowledge, the main value and purpose of it is to provide us with, if we engage with it properly, to provide us with some sort of access to and experience of genuine wisdom. The two are very different. And in theosophy, you know, quite honestly, if I could find something that was better and more effective, I wouldn't be here talking to you now. I'd be there, wherever that place is, but it's not there. I haven't found it, and I looked. So this is the ground that I find myself standing on, and this is the ground that I find myself now looking toward where it is that we go. I mean, obviously, we can look at traditions, and I find myself in the position of having inherited a mass of traditions. We're talking about Theosophical Society worldwide, but then just take India. You know, I, I'm going to show you, I hope I provide a little bit of time to show you something about Adyar, the international headquarters. So there are all these things that we have to try and work through, and also simultaneously we have to decide which things apply and which things don't. There's a uh, Buddhist ceremony that goes on in a certain country, I've forgotten which one. And every year when this ceremony takes place, they get a dog and they tie the dog to a post. And this is one of the key elements involved in this ceremony. At one point somebody asked why the dog is tied. And it had been a while since they had sort of gone into that, so they just talked about how it was something that had 
you know, clearly must have had some sort of uh, psychic or some sort of contribution that it made. Well, it actually turns out that the tradition began because when the Buddha came to give a specific teaching, while he was teaching, there was a pesky dog who kept coming around, barking around. So they said, well, why don't you tie him over there? So they tied the dog over there, and the meeting went on. And for the next thousand plus years, <laughs> it became an inviolate tradition that came to us from the Buddha himself. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I wish I could think this way. So, you know, this is the sort of thinking we also need to apply to many of the things that we might regard or have been told have some sort of special or sacred content. You know, I'm very attracted to Buddhism and probably my, uh, a lot of my practice has derived from certain things that are familiar to Buddhism. But one of the things I do like, at it's, it's not a religion is one thing that I like, it's a philosophy. There are Buddhist Christians and Buddhist theosophists and Buddhists all kinds of things. But the idea that you accept nothing that does not accord itself with your own understanding and your own common sense. And it makes no difference who tells it to you, even if it's me. <laughs> so, looking to the future. We have certain resources. We have a, more profoundly, we have a connection that has been unbroken. And there was a time when there were Mahatma letters that were being precipitated. But you know, for those who are familiar with the letters, there is the idea that a connection, there is an inner connection with, with this society that was founded for their purposes. So to the extent that we are able to align ourselves, then those purposes are served. Any organization, any person, once we exhaust our usefulness in serving a particular purpose, that thing dies. I mean, that's just the nature of birth and death. So it's true with any organism, with any institution. And there will be a time when the Theosophical Society, like the countless religions that have come before us that nobody even knows about, will exhaust, will have fulfilled its purpose, and will have migrated into the fabric of that which has come next. I mean, the object of all of this is to make ourselves no longer useful. We've done this perfectly when the work that we have come here to do no longer justifies doing that particular work. We're not near there yet. But that's the object, to put yourself out of business. <laughs> So one of the things, okay, we have this ground to build upon now. We have a common language. We have a common thought basis. A lot of it is being utilized by what's going to be one of the leading edges of the changes that come in the future, which is to say the scientific community is rapidly moving in this direction of the recognition that the underlying factor beneath everything that they study and the missing link in every single formula and theorem is consciousness. That's going to come. I mean, the structures that have supported the sort of science that we have now have reached obvious limits. It's getting to the point where the scientists themselves are really chafing at the bit with this. It's difficult to endanger your career by coming just outright and speaking in terms of consciousness, but there is now such an obvious movement in that direction that it's not going to be very long before it becomes an open and obvious form of study. That's going to come. So that aspect of it is right on the cusp of actually merging with the very sorts of things that HPB spoke about. And she said very clearly that science will be our greatest ally. That's coming. So where does the Theosophical Society stand in the midst of this? I mean, the fact is that our 
society is not here to be a scientific organization. You know, there are laboratories that are funded to do that. That's not our thing. Tibetan Buddhism and other religions of the world were an awareness of the inner meaning of that was brought to the world through the work of the Theosophical Society. Now you go in you know, any city of any moderate size in England or almost any place else in the world, and there is some qualified Tibetan Lama who's living there. You know, there are Hindu priests who are living there, who are teaching from their life experience and life training in that particular avenue. So the world doesn't need the Theosophical Society to introduce it to Tibetan Buddhism or to you know, the riches of the Hindu faith. So where do we stand? I think essentially one of the things, one of the problems that we need to be aware of, it becomes very, very easy in any situation when we speak to one another, we get it. We understand the terms. We know the language and we appreciate the sort of freedom that we feel in being able to express ourselves to one another. And that's a wonderful thing. But that in and of itself certainly is not enough. One of the things that we've started doing for about the last two or three years in the United States is this. Um, because there are numerous organizations that are active in the world right now all around this area of consciousness, every one of them owes their beginning to the work of the Theosophical Society. All of them. Anything that you can point to in the field of contemporary spirituality owes its existence to the fact that theosophy came in and cultivated the land and got it all ready for this next seed that they just walk up and grow. <laughs> you know? So many of these organizations are quite cognizant of this. But you find this silo mentality, you know, where there's the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and they're doing science and consciousness. There's another group that's doing practices that you know, sort of root you in the experience of consciousness. There's another one that's doing something about meditation, mindfulness, all of this than the Theosophical Society. And there are all of these silos around the world speaking and preaching to each other and hoping to draw somebody from over there over here. And I think it's a wrong approach. It's a wrong way of looking at the world. And it's part of the problem that we find in the world in general. A separatism. A separation that seems so natural because Obviously, there are borders around things. You know, we know this because you know, I live in America, you live in the UK. And there are clear lines, unless you actually go up in space and don't find them. But the clear lines, of course, are clearly drawn you know, in different places here and here. And it's difficult to overcome, mainly because it's difficult for us to even see. They say, they, nobody knows who it is that discovered water. But we do know that it was not a fish. <laughs> that much we know. And we find ourselves functioning in the same sort of, you know, we're swimming in a certain water, and it's very difficult, very difficult for us to perceive it. So, what we started doing a while ago in the US was recognizing this, that first of all, some of what we have in terms of this sense of maintaining our different silos, in many ways it's, it's based on a certain fear that we have. A couple of fears come in from an organization, organizational point of view. One of which would be that there is the fear that if somehow we associate our minds and our thinking with this other thing, that in some way we will lose our identity as this theosophist or these theosophists that we think of ourselves as. 
you know, that if I start going too deeply into the approaches of science, or if I become involved too deeply with Buddhism or with a mindfulness practice, then in some way I'll, I'll lose my identity as a theosophist. That's, to my mind, is a fear-based, you know, we'll be, we will be brainwashed or something like that. And I have asked the question of people who have posed this to me in different terms, but as on a serious basis, you know, which one of you wakes up in the morning, goes out to work, at work you're associated with a whole lot of different people, you know, angry people, frustrated people, people who don't like their job, the occasional one who does. You know, you go out and you associate with that, you come home. Do you remember who you are when you come home? Or have you forgotten? I, I think it's a false sort of artificial barrier. So, you know, that's one. And then the other one is the fear that perhaps we will lose membership. That if we introduce our members to these other sorts of things, then they'll go there. What we've started doing in the United States, and it's just recent, started with four groups. The Institute of Noetic Sciences, the Integral Transformative Practice, a group called Green Heart and the Theosophical Society. Each one has a certain reach into the community of conscious individuals. And the idea was that what we would do is we would not merge our organizations because they're different, they're pointed in different directions, but that there would be certain clear places where we can collaborate, where we can work together, where we can focus the various resources that each organization has toward the promotion of that thing that will in fact introduce all of them to this much broader public. And so we've started doing that. And it's something that is having its effects now. Just before I came here, I was speaking at the uh, Institute of Noetic Sciences. They have an annual or biannual convention. And they had asked me to speak. I was the, the opening night, the, the last speaker that they had. And you know, 650 people who come to that event, and it's 650 people involved in the sciences, involved in a lot of different things that are very, very much out there in the cutting edge of what we would think of as consciousness movement. So it, members from the Theosophical Society came to that event because the head of IONS had just been at our convention as well. And out of this merging, you have members who have, from the Theosophical Society who have taken a great interest in the scientific aspect, the approach toward consciousness. You have members of IONS who are now remembering that the Theosophical Society exists and that we stand for something. And that there is, in fact, this much, much broader context that they're finding that all of the things that they're doing have a place within this theosophical context that you cannot find elsewhere. You can find something about mind, quieting it, its effects on the body, but how does that relate to the total human being in the perspective, from the perspective of, uh, of theosophy? It's very incomplete, and many people feel that. So, you know, part of my, the impetus for all of this is that, you know, my personal sense is that this is a very, very particular time that we find ourselves fortunate enough to have been born into. It would have been lovely to have been in contact with HPB when she was here. I don't know if it would have been so lovely to be so close to her because they say she could cuss like a sailor if you crossed her the wrong way. <laughs> but that would have been lovely. But not many people actually measured up to the task that was needed at that time. But so we find ourselves in a time when the cream is rising to the top. And we're very, very fortunate. I used to have this sense of how I felt so sorry 
you know, I really felt sad for my daughter, what lay ahead for her, because of the world that she was going to be inheriting from the way that we have mistreated it. You know, everybody knows uh, pollution is having effects, climate change, all of these things are having these profound effects now that are going to be passed on to others. It used to be, when I was thinking this way, that you know the more advanced scientists were, they had models for when the bottom was actually going to drop out of this thing. And you know, I was so sad for my daughter because it was clear that I would have been dead and gone by the time these you know, ecological catastrophes occurred. So I would say, oh, poor her, poor Angelique. Of course, the science has improved. The models have gotten more precise. And now, if we continue to behave in the way we are behaving, it's going to hit us. So now, forget about my poor daughter. I'm in the soup now, you know? So <laughs> I want to help you. <laughs> but I also want to help me. So it's a fortunate thing. Because it forces us to look more deeply. It forces us to look into what it is we know, to find that, and then to call out for what it is we do not know. That's the main demand that it makes. And so we find ourselves in a time of a global calling in a way. And these calls are not, don't go unanswered. And so many people find themselves, you know, I'm in this position now traveling around the world. And wherever I go, there are people who are, there are small groups of people who are very active in this fostering of a new consciousness. There are individuals who are profoundly in touch and anchoring certain energies here for all of us on the planet. And you run into these people. And this is the time that we're in now. And very often, when we have meetings such as this, we really have no true appreciation of the impact and the value of such a thing as this. Quite often, our reasons for coming here are good reasons, but often they're focused on, you know, rather tightly on ourselves. What actually gets us into the seats is often because we remember how pleasant it was to be together last year, and we want that sort of community again. You know, we have this sense of somehow we feel so much more enlarged when we're together and when we're able to talk and think and listen to these ideas and these concepts that are liberating. So we feel good from this, the exercise of coming together. But it's really something much greater that we actually end up doing. because. It doesn't necessarily always happen, but it does in fact happen that from time to time at meetings such as this, where a group of us are together, where the energies that we have cultivated over the course of a lifetime and through a genuinely focused practice, we find ourselves in each other's presence. And for a moment maybe, it might not be any more than that, for a moment, we find ourselves in a state where somehow or another, we've been slightly lifted away from ourselves, and a certain harmony falls upon us. And we know when it happens. Nobody has to tell us. You know, we feel somehow larger than we were a few moments before. And we feel that. And at those moments are the moments that a group such as this becomes usable. We become an avenue through which these energies of these higher ones are able to actually find an opening into this world. And it may be brief, 
But through this opening, effects are able to be generated. And we don't have to know how. We don't have to know where. Our work is being here, allowing for a harmony. This isn't a matter of will. You know, this is the part, the will part is what we do with ourselves. How we do our own practice, how we do our study, how we do our service, how we cultivate the ground for this to find itself uh, present. We do that. And then comes the moment where we are able to actually, the true practice is to get to the point where we can cease from willing. It's not about us. And in those moments, something happens. And so for the Theosophical Society, it's pointed very specifically. It's not something that's here for personal betterment. It's here for the betterment and for the advancement to that next stage for the human family. And so this inner side of it is really where the future of our society is, where our past lays, and it's where our future lies. There's nothing new. There is no new future plan that needs to be mapped out. The work is actually the same. Obviously, there are going to be differences in the way that we express things. I mean, HPB had a certain way of doing it. We have to have our way. Uh, it's related, but if it's identical, then you're speaking to the past. So we have to develop those things. And that's things that we're doing. But I would say that given that sort of thing, then in terms of the future, we don't really have a whole lot to worry about. You know, things will happen, bad things will happen, good things will happen. But the main idea is that as all of these things happen, it happens as everything moves and moves ahead. And we play our role in it. We're not always going to get it right. I mean, clearly. The, just the fact that we're people having to deal with each other, there are going to be problems. Always have been. <laughs> so why are we going to be any different? So those things, as I say, if we could just be a little bit more generous with each other, a lot of those things can slide to the side. I'm very impressed in many ways with what's happening here in England, because one of the things that is important for the future of the Theosophical Society is that we have to have sustainable Theosophical organizations in the world. And from my conversations with various ones of you, I'm very, uh, I'm impressed with the level of thinking that is going into trying to be sure that the Theosophical Society in England will in fact be sustainable going forward. So that's the sort of thing that you have to do. Different countries devise different ways. I should say too, and I, you know, I, I have some slides that I do would I would like to show you about Adyar. Um, Many of you have ideas or images of Adyar, but maybe haven't even seen it. Uh, and really, one of the other things that has become part of this sort of separative mentality that we've fallen prey to is the fact that this is, a, this is an international organization, worldwide. And it also has an international center, which is the Adyar Center in India. And I think in many ways, TS in America has focused on TS in America. TS in England has focused on TS in England. Italy, you know, all around the world, we find ourselves focusing on this and forgetting the sort of thinking that involves us in connection to this greater body within which we all move. There's one theosophical society in the world. Even the ones that are not part of the Theosophical Society, Adyar, there is only one Theosophical movement that's taking place in the world. And it was all initiated, and it was all empowered from those same sources. So I think it helps sometimes to stretch ourselves, to allow these, as I say, mind-created borders 
and heart-enforced borders. At least to come down for a minute. We'll bring them back up. But at least allow them to fall for a moment. So I'd like to show you just a few things, just a few pictures of the Adyar campus. Uh, and uh, just to introduce you, some of you introduce you to it. Can I ask first, how many of you have actually been to Adyar in India? Oh, quite a few. Yeah, I know, Angelique, you've been. <laughs> well, good. Well, I'll I want to show you a few things. And then I'd also like, I definitely want to see if I can provide time for questions. So I'll try and run through these, because I don't want to go. I definitely don't want to impinge on tea. I'm, you know, I want to be invited back at some point. <laughs> and I know if I mess with the tea time, I'm in trouble. So anyway, at your campus. Can you, can you all see? So just to give you a picture of where it is, South India. So it's right on the Bay of Bengal there, um, toward the south. And it's, it gets a little warm down there. In fact, they say there are two, three different climates. One is hot, one is hotter. And you know what the next one is. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is actually the Adyar campus here. It's a huge, uh, it's actually 257 acres in a city of 7 million people. So it's just a little, about 100 acres smaller than Hyde Park. Uh, it's the second largest green space in the city of Chennai. When Adyar started, it was, there was the Adyar River, and then it was the, uh, on this side was rice paddies and things like that, no city development. The whole city was on this side, on the north side of the river. Uh, since the founding, the city of Chennai now stretches 35 kilometers past this Adyar campus. So it's engulfed it. Just a closer, another look. So again, Adyar River, Bay of Bengal, and all of this is the Adyar campus. So just some of the sites that you would see if you were there. The Banyan tree, the great Banyan tree, which is the uh, second largest banyan tree in the, in the Indian subcontinent. Actually, the original tree right there has, oops, the original tree that it came from, which is this part here, has died, but then you have all of these things that have grown out from it. It used to be that when you came to the airport, if you didn't know the address or how to tell the cab driver how to get there, you'd just say, take me to the banyan tree, and they would know. These are water buffalo. These are not, a good deal of it is forested land uh, that has been just kept in its natural state. These water buffalo actually swim across the river and come over here at some good eating. So they come and just hang out for the day and then go back. <laughs> These things, I, you look from afar and they look like little fruit. It's actually fruit bats. And they have a wingspan about the size of my daughter. Uh, they're, they're not small. So uh, it's, not, it's not vampires. <laughs> this, this, is, this, this is not what attacked, uh, what's that? <laughs> Did I say something wrong? Big wingspan, large, <laughs> wide. Oh, OK. Coconut grove that were planted by some of the, uh, and they have their own coconuts, mangoes, sapota, papaya. This is a map of the actual campus. There are about 111 buildings on the campus. Many of them are in various states of disrepair. Headquarters building, probably some of you have seen pictures of this. Uh, this is a heritage building, historic building. Um, this is where uh, my office is upstairs. Uh, actually, it's right on, you don't see the rest of the building. It's right over there. That's actually the balcony where the teachings that, uh, where the Mahatma came into the balcony during one time of the teachings. My office is actually Blavatsky, where she lived. This part actually has been added on to the building, all of this. Oops. This is the uh, hall downstairs. A lot of the meetings are held there. You can see you know, a few hundred people. Another view. There's a museum there as well. And this is inside of the museum. Uh, in that same building. This you may recognize. It's, uh, those of you who are familiar with the Mahatma letters know that a teacup and saucer was materialized by HPB. This is the actual 
teacup and saucer. And you know, this is just a sign of Ed, Annie Besant lived there, Alcott, HPB. These are different placards around. J. Krishnamurti, when he was uh, found by Besant and Leadbitter, uh, Annie Besant constructed a special residence for him up here, a special apartment that was his. Oh, I missed it. Uh, these are some of the, this is a, sort of an idyllic scene. I have to show you a slide of it because you won't see it ever again if you come there. I can't say ever, but during my time, you will not see cows roaming the campus of the Adyar campus because, you know, actually this became something of a minor internet uh, phenomenon. When I got there, oh, a year and a half ago, we had 30 some odd cows. Uh, a lot of people feel as if we probably have had cows there all along, but in fact, we had bulls who used to pull the carts. We had a few of the bulls. And someone thought, well, it would be nice to bring in a cow. <laughs> Just one. So as I say, by the time I got there, there were 30 <laughs> cows. So I mean, right away, we're not in the business of caring for cows. And you know, although the people do their best to care for them, there is no specific cow herder position there. And so they you know, they would feed them, but in summertime, the cows would get thin and they weren't really getting the proper treatment. So arranged, found a place where they could be taken, where they would not go to the slaughterhouse, and gave them away. Well, it popped up on the internet as the Theosophical Society, well, not even the Theosophical Society, I think it was probably me personally, had sold all of the cows to the slaughterhouse. So, then later on, the same person who likes to do this sort of thing got a hold of a story where the, the, they got a picture where the grass had grown up at the Alcott School. And so several months later, in his first article, he wrote about how they had been sold to the slaughterhouse and had been killed. Second time he came back, he saw the grass growing on the campus, and he says the Theosophical Society needs to go back and get those cows back again because they would eat this grass. So a little bit of a conflict in his thinking. but. Uh, or else he feels that we can actually bring things back from the dead. So what has happened now, there were still, f you know, when I went away and came back several months later, we had gained two more cows. <laughs> so I said, at this point, it's no point having it and having it and having it. So we arranged this time, there are places in India called gaushalas, which are specifically places for the sacred cows. The cow is highly regarded. And there is no possibility of any harm coming. They're certified. So we found one of those and uh, made sure that these remaining cows went there and were well photographed and documented on their way there. So you, I want to show you this because this is the last time you'll see that. There are many temples erected to the different religions there. This is the Buddhist temple, a mosque. Liberal Catholic Church. These are all over the campus. There's a shrine for the Sikh religion. There's a Parsi shrine. This is Zoroastrian. This is the uh, Hindu temple. Very Leadbeater Chambers is where most of you who, if you did come, you probably stayed here. This is where people who come from abroad tend to stay. Actually, this was the first, in all of India, this was the first concrete and stone, I mean the concrete and steel building built in the, uh, in the entire Indian subcontinent. Theosophical Society used to be really on the cutting edge of a lot of things. Blavatsky Bungalow, if you came for the School of the Wisdom, this is where it's held. I do notice, you know, in the United States, they have a very different concept of bungalow. Bungalow is where a nice little middle class family might live with their wife, one dog, and one child. This is a bungalow on one, on one floor, yeah. Just different views. Oops, I haven't cut back again. That's Krishnamurti's home. So anyway, here's another view. You've seen the facade. One of the things that is comes along with having buildings that are over 100 years old that are in a climate where water Actually, water is the primary problem that we have. Humidity, rainwater seeping into the buildings, and in this sort of humid climate, things deteriorate 
very quickly. This is an example of one of the roofs, it's a tile roof, but you have problems with many of the roofs, you have problems with uh, the downspouts, and it does damage such as this. Beautiful building, but uh, largely, you know, the water that has infiltrated is causing extensive damage. Trees had been allowed to grow up. I mean, this is on the roof of a building. This is the banyan tree. Trees have been allowed to grow up right next to the building, actually encroaching onto the building. Another source of my uh, 15 minutes of fame in Indian newspapers came when, no, not the banyan, no. But no, I, when I got there, one of the things that was clear is that this sort of thing is something that is clearly harmful to any structure. You know it here in England, you know it all around the world, but the approach that had been adopted uh, had been that nature needs to be allowed its way, which is fine. I mean, we have a whole forested area where that needs to apply. But at the same time, where you have human-made structures, this does not work. And so one of the things that I did was I ha had some of these trees pruned, and there was a uh, pathway that had started to become overgrown, and I had the sucker trees that had grown up in there taken out. Well, uh, somebody, and again, this just gives you a sort of a slice of my life. Uh, within the Adyar campus, there are 130 people who are working there, and some of whom are not particularly fond of the others. So the person who was involved with the gardening, who was just acting upon what I did, someone didn't particularly like him, and he sent a story to the newspaper, which they actually printed, about how 75 old growth trees had been felled at the Adyar campus. Complete fabrication. But even if it had been true, there are about 100,000 trees on the campus. So anyway, this is the sort of thing. So that became a minor uh, article of uh, interest for a day. This is actually water damage, and this is just outside of where our archives are held. Actually, the archives, if you go, this is a doorway over here. This is a look at the ceiling. If you go in there, that's where the archives are, where the letters from Blavatsky, some of the letters from the masters, Annie Besson's papers are kept in there. This is the archives. And you see signs of water infiltrating. Uh, I've just, one of the benefits of being president of two organizations, particularly one such as the American section that is had rather resource rich, is that uh, have said that really we're not regarding this as two different places that you work. So our archivist from uh, the United States, who is actually a professionally trained archivist, had her to come over here to work with our archives there. Because it, it had been virtually shuttered for the last number of years. Uh, so this is something that's gonna be in progress. I'll tell you more about the archives as we go along. Uh, outside the wall, you've seen the beautiful forest and the beautiful building. You step outside the gate into Chennai, and here you are. It's a booming, bustling, ever-moving city. One of the signs of uh, the times, you know, this is looking from the roof of the headquarters building, there's a bridge, but you start to see how development, quite a bit of development is coming our way, even closer. It used to be that the rivers and the bay front was something that was left to the fisher people. I mean, they took a very different view. As you know, any place in the United States or in the United Kingdom, waterfront property is the most valuable. That idea had not yet reached here, but the fishermen are starting to get pushed to other places. This is a huge five-star hotel over here and a high-level high luxury development. And this yet even closer. Actually, they're building condominiums right around where we are, large condominium building. One of the ways that it's advertising, they're building a new one that's almost sold out. And the way that it's advertised is something that I'm sure is un-British and un-American for sure. The placard in front of it says, the most expensive condominiums in Chennai. <laughs> and they're selling just like 
tea and scones. <laughs> because there is a rising middle class in India, and they want to have ways to spend and to express. And so that is all coming in, which is making, putting further pressures on our, uh, on our campus at Adya. So anyway, in comes Mikhail Haas. Some of you may know him. He's, uh, he lives in Narden. He's uh, an architect of some note. At least I knew he was of some note. We met last year. Started talking about the needs of Adyar. Uh, and he signed on. You know, he said he, he wants to help with this. His father was a theosophist. He's a theosophist, his brothers. I had told him at that time that really what I need, you know, I appreciate his architectural advice, and it's needed. But I don't need someone who's going to come, give me a plan, and walk away. I need someone who can, first of all, give me a plan that's sustainable, and a plan that can uh, apply to the terms of the place where we are. I don't need a, a, a Holland-specific plan. I need something that will work on the ground in India. He was very familiar with that. And he, since that time, he's been back within the last year. We've been together there for on three or four different occasions uh, in developing this plan, which is actually now in place. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So already we, had, we did a survey of the buildings. First of all, we had to determine which ones are our focus. And we're focusing on four. The headquarters, Raja House, which is connected to it, that place where Krishnamurti lived the Leadbeater Chambers, and then the Blavatsky Bungalow. Those are the four most used places on the campus. So we've done our surveys. And now we have some ideas, some things that are going to be put into place quickly, and some things that we're going to be putting into place over time. Uh, next year, I'm going to be building, we are going to be building a new archives building. We're going to take it away from the river. It's right next to the river, uh, which is, you know, the tsunami, we got lucky. Because the river, if you're sitting in the archives, the river's outside the window. I mean, if this were the archives, that's where the river is. So we got lucky on that one. But we're going to move it to the, it'll be behind the library. This is actually the Alcott, uh, it's the uh, Library and Research Center. So back here is the back of it. And basically, it's going to be something that will run from here to here. And it'll be, you know, an archives building is actually very easy to build. And when you think in terms of the cost here, it's one thing. But when you think in terms of those same costs translated to India, we're going to be able to put this building up here for about, uh, well, in dollars, it will be about 40,000 US dollars. So what is that, uh, 30,000 pounds, maybe. So, and that'll be, those of you who come toward the end of 2016, you'll see that. We have a plan for an info center. And again, this is right on the main street outside of our gate. We, have, we already have an info center there, but it's not functional. These are sea containers. Uh, these are being used nowadays to create uh, housing in a lot, of different, uh, a lot of different settings. And we have the plan calls for using these sea containers to erect an uh, information center. Uh, of those of you who were there at IDR, how many of you were there at the time of the convention? All right, so a number of you. Our convention is held at the Adyar Theater, which is outdoors, which when the convention is not in progress, this is what it looks like. It's a stage, you know, with some trappings behind it. Every year at convention time, we erect a structure to prevent the wind, the rain, and the sun from uh, falling on the thousand plus people that sit in here. So it goes a week before the, the conference begins, the structure goes up. A week after, it comes down. And we've been doing that for a number of years. This structure used to be thatch. Now it's corrug corrugated. But uh, thatch, they found too many temples caught fire and wasn't a good idea. So anyway, it moved up to corrugated. Um, you know, this is what the convention starts to look like when people are there. So the structure that we're going to have, those of you who are coming this year, uh, the last thing I did before I left Adyar in July was to sign the contract to erect a new permanent structure that will, uh, that will be covering this. And I'll show you some drawings of that, and I'll be interested in your opinion. 
So this is the material that it's going to be made out of. It's a tensile fiber that's used uh, all over the world, and it covers it, and I think in a very elegant sort of way. It's also a very modern material, and I think it sort of speaks to the fact that the Theosophical Society has, in its history, been forward-looking. This material has about a 20, 30-year lifespan, so it's not something that's just a, just a tent. This is a view from the inside, how it will look. So September 25th, as part of the contract, that's when it's going to be up. Here's an example of it in use. This is actually the Denver Airport, International Airport. It's been there for 20 plus years now. So it's a durable stroke fabric. And then finally, you know, for our little time here today, this is something that I'm viewing as a priority, which is to say that as it stands right now, electrical energy is used at the Adair campus and there are continually different brownouts and blackouts that take place. But to put up an, a solar field at the campus would be, again, in European and British terms, not a whole lot. I mean, something like that, we would require about, a, about uh, five acres of land, which we have, uh, and around couple of hundred thousand US dollars. And then we will be completely energy self-sufficient. And then you can also start thinking about air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just want to share some images of you. And one of the things that's going to be happening that we're going to be doing, oh, this isn't directed toward that, but obviously a lot of this is going to cost money and it's going to cost a substantial amount from the point of view of, of India. But worldwide, we're looking to raise in the air around one million U.S. dollars, which it works out to about three hundred thousand dollars per project. And so that's something that I will be getting in touch with you about as time goes on. But that wasn't the purpose of this one. <laughs> so thank you, thank you once again. It's been wonderful.